Lord, it would touch the ears of those that, that are here and those that are at home, Lord, and it will permeate through the airwaves. We uh, ask for your blessings on Pastor Dave and the three people that are down in New Zealand, Lord, that they're enjoying the beach in the warm sun, Lord, as we saw, as I saw today on their video, Lord, that you would just give them uh, ministering angels to be with them, traveling mercies, wisdom, and discernment. And we give you all the glory and the honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So I heard from Pastor Dave today. He's having a good time. They arrived late last night. They were having breakfast this morning when they called us at noon today, when he called me. He's got two or three, uh, uh, three or four minute clips on the, uh, the Jesus Network or at Ephesians Visions Ministry. So if you want to watch, they're standing on the beach. They're picking up whole sand dollars and looking at them. So they're having a good time. So hi, Dave. Everybody holler hi to Pastor Dave. So, Tell him we want sand yeah, bring us all a sand dollar, will you? There's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve of us here. Is that like a hundred dollar bill? <laughs> Speaking of a hundred dollar bill, a minister was asked by a politician, name something the government can do to help the church. The minister replied, quit making dollar bills. Because that's what people put in the thing. Well, that one didn't go over well. We won't ever use that again. (laughs) The secret of a good sermon, according to George Burns. Everybody remember George Burns in here? He says, the secret to a good sermon is to have a good beginning and a good ending and have the two as close together as possible. (laughs) That one's too bad. I may save that one for the future. The the pastor happily told his congregation about the church's new public address system. He explained that the microphone and the wiring were donated, were paid for with church funds. Then he added, but the loudspeaker was donated by a member of our church in memory of his wife. (laughs) I'll quit there. So I'm sorry, I apologize. We don't have a PowerPoint presentation tonight and some of the beautiful pictures that I found, but we will next week. If you remember last week, we talked in Revelation chapter 7 about God's grace and mercy and about the 144,000 that were, were chosen, 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel and what their functions were and how they were, how, how they were to serve. Tonight, we're going to talk about the multitudinous Gentiles. So you can turn to Revelation chapter 9, and the same handout for last week is being used tonight. And they were, there were some left here. So we're talking about the great multitude of Gentiles. And out of uh, Ed Heinsohn's book, Revelation Unlocking the Future, he says, can anybody be saved during the tribulation? There will be p- people converted during the tribulation period. Well, the witness of the church and its restraining force in society is missing the omnipresent Holy Spirit, will still convict men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. John 16, 7 to 11 says, But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, and this is Jesus speaking, the Counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of sin, of guilt in regard to sin, and righteousness and judgment, in regard to sin because men do not believe in me in regard to righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer and in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. It is true that many will believe what is false and be deceived by a deluding influence. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 says, And in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refuse to love the truth, so to be saved. For this reason God sends them a powerful delusion, so they will believe the lie, so all that will be condemned who do not believe the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. Nevertheless, we see both Jew and Gentile converts believing in Jesus as their Savior in Revelation 7. No wonder they cry out, literally keep on crying, salvation to our God in Revelation 7.10. Paul Benoit of the Philadelphia Biblical Institute writes, one of the major purposes of the tribulation is to save people. 
That's what it comes down to. And that's what Revelation chapter 7 does is to save people. Mankind's apathy and unconcern about spiritual matters will be swept away during the tribulation when the world is started by supernatural signs and shaken by cataclysmic events. We're going to discuss some of those. The 144,000 will probably came to faith during this time along with a multitude of others as evidenced by the large numbers who will be martyred for their faith. The Holy Spirit will be very active during the days of the tribulation since it is he who re- who regenerates people, giving them eternal life. Titus 3, 5 says, He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So we have salvation and save. The Holy Spirit is not removed from the world, as many pastors and preachers teach. It's not removed at the rapture event, as some have taught. It's a ministry of restraining sin that is removed. The omnipresent spirit is still here, will still be here at that time, still running around the earth, still having people saved. So it says in Joel, whoever calls upon the Lord will be saved. It doesn't just stop because the rapture of the church has occurred or because we've opened the seven seals. It doesn't stop, just the restraining power. And we know that has to be, restraining power has to be removed in, in order for the Antichrist to come forward. John Walford, who is the Chancellor Emeritus of Dallas Theological Seminary, states chapter 7 of the book of Revelation serves as a review of the situation described in all the previous chapters and emphasizes two important facts. One, God is going to judge Israel in the period of a great trial. We know it's the time of Jacob's trouble. We know it's going to be a judgment of Israel as well as a judgment of the nations. And 12,000 from each tribe totaling 144,000 will be protected and sealed from the judgments which will fall upon the world in general. Second, a great multitude of Gentiles will also be saved. Many of these will be martyred, and a multitude of the martyred dead are found in heaven rejoicing in the presence of the Lamb and representing every tongue and nation. We'll read about that in a minute. It's an indication that even in the tragic closing hours, prior to the second coming of Christ to the earth, countless souls will find Christ as a Savior and be saved by grace. Revelation chapter nine, or, or chapter seven, verse nine. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds, peoples, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. John states after this, after what? After the 144,000 have been sealed by the Spirit of God, God's message is always first to the Jews, and then to the Gentiles. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God under salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and to the, also to the Greek. So this has been preached in the Bible. The Jews are first and then the Gentiles come. And here the 144,000 are first and then the Gentiles come. Since the Jews have heard, John sees a great multitude standing before the throne, which no man can count, from every race, nationality, every tongue. Their white robes prove that they have trusted in the message of the blood and are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. The waving of the palms in their hands signifies victory. They have overcome. They have overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. They're joyous because they have survived the first six seals of judgment, and their joy leads to praise. Verse 10 says, They cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. They recognize where their salvation comes from and where their victory comes from. They cannot be kept silent. Who could be silent? How could you be silent? Could you be silent in front of God if you've just been brought to heaven? Wouldn't you be yelling and cheering even more than you were at the pro football game or something? or whatever, hallelujah, we, should, we all would. The angels then join in celebrating and cheering with them as they praise the Father and the Son. Verse 11, And all the angels stood around the throne, I had a nice picture of this, and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. Verse 12, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever, Amen. What a glorious scene is the angels surrounding the throne and God's people all celebrating, falling on their faces, praising him, adoring him. Their sevenfold praise session, again, to reiterate, has to do with blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might forever and ever. 
No wonder they say amen. The one of the elders asked a question. He has a question. But before we see that question, I'm going to answer part of it with what Newell says from 1946. Boy, these old books are just right on. 65 years old. Older than some of us in this room. Quite a few of us, probably. <clears throat> right, Don? I'm going to pick on you later. Okay, but I'm going to pick on you later. Just be ready. There arises also the difficult question is what means were used, what message to save this great multitude, this company. We're told that they came out of the great tribulation. That sometimes doesn't make sense. And we know from Daniel 12, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Jeremiah 30, and Revelation that this must be the last half of the 70th week of Daniel. We know it's the first half. We know it's the first part of the week that the seals are broken. But why do they call it the Great Tribulation? At this time in Revelation chapter 7, the tribulation is in the future. It's overwhelmingly terrible. It will be a particular time of trouble for Jacob, for Israel, and it will come on all that d them that dwell on the earth. In the last passage in Revelation 3.10, we find that the, the, uh, its object is to try them that dwell on the earth. The true saints of this age... And even those that come out of the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church, will be overcomers. There will be some overcomers in them, in that church too, that will be saved. Are to sit with Christ in the throne and will be kept from the hour of trial. That's one of your advantages when you're, when you're in the first reload, when the church is raptured up, you will get to sit with Christ and avoid the hour of trial. But what of those that are left after the rapture of the church? It is upon these that the hour of trial comes. Now we're not told it's the hour of universal damnation, but of trial. Doubtless those who receive not the love of the truth will be given over to believe the lie, devil worship. But who does not, but does not the rise of the world where trial indicate that some may endure it? Many people come through trials, we all have, every one of us here. Even the enemies of God knew about God, the theme and the Lamb under the sixth seal in chapter 6. Bibles have been scattered all over the earth, and every nation men have not yet saved know about the Lamb of God and his sacrifice for sin. When the awful worldwide hour of trial sets in, it seems that thousands will wash their robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb at all costs. We must confess this is a difficult question to determine as the exact relationship of this great multitude to the great tribulation. In view of the fact that the same preposition, ek, ek, is used here as in Revelation 3.10, where the saints are kept out of ek, the hour of trial. So the question be, is begged. This is not in my notes. Why does it say great tribulation then? Then all of a sudden we're going to have seven trumpets and seven seals. We're going to deal with, with Babylon. We're going to deal with a variety of other things that are terrible, that are very terrible. But these people came out of the Great Tribulation. And my thought is, it's not in a systematic bang, bang, bang order. There is some overlap of everything that goes on. Things don't just stop and then restart. This is a progressive thing through the entire part of Tribulation. Progressive. Progressively worse. Not, okay, we're going to do this, and then we're going to stop here and have a cup of coffee and a cup of tea and some crumpets and talk about it. There will be silence in heaven. Because... They see what's coming. They hear what's coming. This is the last we're going to hear about things, because after this it's all, I mean, the last we're going to see things, because after this they're just going to hear. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in the white robes, and whence they come? The answer. And I said to him, Sir, thou knowest. He said to me, They are the which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is verse 14 of chapter 7. It's another proof the church is in heaven, not on earth. Why? John doesn't recognize this group. He doesn't know who these people are. Yet he knows they've been saved. They're washed in white robes. They have salvation. But he doesn't know who we are. He says that there. These are tribulation saints who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Hear this again. These are they which came out of the great tribulation. That's the verse. That settles it and explains why John, who recognized the church in heaven initially, doesn't know who these individuals are. 
He doesn't know who they are, except he recognized them as saints who have been saved because they have white robes. They are new brothers and sisters in Christ. They've been saved in a definite period of time when he and the church are in heaven. The church was not on earth to make their acquaintance. Which tells me, and which I've taught, there's more than one rapture. There's a rapture of the church, there's a rapture of the martyrs and the saints that come during the tribulation, and there's an end time rapture before the great judgment. So we've got more than one rapture. The main rapture is the rapture of the church because they're in heaven watching this. John knows them. John knows who they are. He's familiar with them. These new martyrs, he doesn't know. So that's the second rapture, the mid-trib rapture. And there'll be other raptures that are smaller during this because he says that they're saved in different period of time, different than when the church is in heaven because the church is already up there. They reign, these, the church is the bride of Christ and enjoys the thousand year honeymoon upon earth. They reign as rulers, kings, and priests. First Peter 2.9 tells us, but you are a choice and chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation of people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The 144,000 now serve as bodyguards of the Lamb and his bride. The Gentiles saved during the tribu tribulation will be the temple servants. They will, have be, they will be present, but they will be servants waiting on Christ and the bride of Christ, which is us, the church. They will be the servants. They serve in a glorious temple. That was described in, in Ezekiel 40 to 48, which is set up immediately after Ezekiel 38 and 39, where we talked about Russia under the names of Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, and Rosh after it's destroyed. Everything is so near. Russia could march soon. The Antichrist could be smashed. And the Lord will return for his bride, with his bride. He'll return with his bride. At that time, the millennial temple is erected and the Gentiles serve. Those that are the martyrs will come up and be servants in the temple to Christ, to the elders, and to the church because they've already been taken up. Therefore, as they before the throne, verse 15, therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in this temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Because God is dwelling among them, the deprivations they suffered under the, under the Antichrist are gone. Under the, the reign of the world dictator, they had no food, they had little sustenance. They had to rely on the Antichrist and take upon themselves the number 666, the number of the beast, in order to get their food and supplies. The believers who refused the number had to eke out an existence day by day. Now with the Lord in their midst, the picture changes. This is a whole different thing for the martyred saints that are brought up. They shall, verse 16 says, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. This refers to the scorching effects, because we will read later on in chapter 16, the fourth angel poured out his vial on the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. In addition, the word heat refers to the fires of persecution, as described in 1 Peter 1.7. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Such trials for these people now, because they're in heaven, are done forever. They will never go have to go through these trials again. They have been saved. They've been washed in the blood and they have white robes. Wow. From this point onward, the people of God from all dispensations enjoy the presence of God. Their days of suffering, heartache, abuse by an ungodly world are done. Their tears are wiped away with every remembrance of the past sorrow, which is obliterated from their minds. That they shall hunger and thirst no more indicates the removal of physical discomforts, a clear sign of the resurrection. And neither shall the sun beat down on them nor any heat indicates the removal of the environmental pains, hot, dry, sticky, burn, burning skin, all that. They're out of that. They're in heaven. They're on streets of gold with living waters. Verse 17 from, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, shall lead them into living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away and remove all their tears. The Lamb shepherds and guides the universally innumerable multitude through his kingdom. The water of life stands for an abundant life for the glorified people. There will be no more needs. God will wipe away every tear. And there indicates 
You're not going to cry anymore. You're not going to have any emotional problems. You're just going to have joy in your heart. And that's an old song. I got the joy, 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 joy. Y'all remember that. We sang that way back. Way back when. We used to go to MYF camp, Methodist Youth Fellowship. There are different opinions, again, as who this multitude is. By their white robes and their declaration as to the author of their salvation, everyone agrees that they're believers from earth. I'm going to reiterate this. I, I only going to give it to you. I'm only going to give it to you twice, not three points. This isn't a three-point sermon. It's just kind of a two-point reiteration. So I know you got it. Okay. But the facts that John, the disciple, most closely associated with the church, didn't recognize him, their arrival in heaven, follows the rapture by three chapters. And their destiny is that of servants in the temple as I said, and not co-regents of the universe, means they are post-rapture believers and not part of the church. They've been caught up in, in the destruction of the earth during the first half of the 70th week and have paid their ultimate price for their new pound faith. They're called tribulation martyrs, tribulation saints, but technically neither one of those is an accurate term because the great tribulation hasn't started yet. So we all, I don't have the answers for this. The theologians have differing opinions. i am just, just got to give you the verse and what it says. We're still in the first half of the, first of the 70th week. Remember we talked about Daniel's 70th week and the middle of the Antichrist sets up, commits the abomination of desolation after he's killed and then comes back to life. How do we know that? We talked about translated or out of with the word ek. Revelation 3.10, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. It's the same word that's trans- translated from, from in Revelation 3.10 in the Lord's promise, deliverance of the church. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the world, whole world to test those who live on the earth. According to Strong's Concordance, it's a primary preposition donating origin. It means from, out of, in place of, or cause. So like the church these saints have been removed from the place, the time and the cause of the great tribulation. They didn't come to faith in time for the rapture, so they won't share in the church's unique destiny, destiny and blessing, but most likely finally persuaded to faith by the church's disappearance. They'll be martyred early in the seventh week, so will escape the worst of the tribulation. Later on, the living will envy the dead so much the long for death Death will elude them. Revelation 9, 6 says that. These saints will have a privileged existence in eternity, always in the presence of the Lord. They'll serve him day and night in his temple and will never want for anything. They're servants, but they're still going to want. The Lord will spread his tent over them, meaning that he'll personally be responsible for their welfare. They'll not hunger, nor will they thirst. And the Lord will remove every regret from their minds, wiping away their tears. But never... Neither will they ever sit on the throne at the side of their beloved. Examples for all the universe to see is the incomparable riches of God's grace and expressed in his riches to the church. His work of art, Ephesians 2, 6, tells us, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us within the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved, not faith. And this is not for yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, lest anyone can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God in prayer prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians 2, 6. These martyred saints will never share in his inheritance, nor be counted among the most favored group in all creation. When push came to shove, they needed one more incontroversial sign that it was right to believe. Lacking the faith to accept what they could not see, they required evidence. The evidence came in the form of the rapture of the church when those who believed by faith alone disappeared before their eyes. But too late, they finally believed. John 20, 29, where the Lord says to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Wow. These tribulation saints aren't going to rule and reign for a thousand years. 
just the church is going to rule and reign with them. In the real word, world, blood leaves unsightly stains and white clothing. I know this. I worked in a hospital for back in the 60s and 70s, drove ambulance. We wore white clothes. You know about this too. And blood stains white clothes. But the blood of Christ washes everybody clean and all the other stains and makes the clothing pure and even whiter than bleach can. It's important to notice that these martyrs are not cleansed by the shedding of their own blood, but like all Christian believers, by the blood of the Lamb. Where John reminds us, all his readers, that Christ has freed us from our sins by his, the shedding of his blood. Martyrdom has no merit in itself, yet John wants to make very clear to the congregations in Asia that martyrdom is likely to be the price of a serious commitment to Jesus Christ. If this is so, it's important to assure the churches of the vindication of those who are or will be martyred. So the elder's example continues. The martyr's vindication, he points out, consists partly of what John has just seen, that they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and partly of what is not seen. The conclusion to the sixth seal provides us a glimpse to the final chapter and the final blessedness of God's people. The vision of the sixth seal ends in much the same way the book of Revelation as a whole comes to an end. We're going to talk about that. I can't tell you how many weeks, but we've got a ways to go to get there yet. It's important to remember that John does not actually see any of the final blessedness, as I said. Remember that either here or in chapter 21, he hears it from heavenly beings. In this case, one of the elders in chapter 21, a loud voice from the throne. When I get to chapter 8, he's going to hear a loud voice from the throne. And the very voice of the one seated on the throne, 21.5. The principle of vindication is established by what John has seen in verses 9 to 12. But the particulars are described with a certain reserve as a promise to the taken on in faith. Although John is far more eager than Paul, Paul to tell us about his visions. 2 Corinthians 12 tells us, 1-6, to 6, Paul's visions. There I, I must go on boasting, although there's nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows, and I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows was caught up in paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Many a people have gone up to the throne room to heaven. Don has been there. Don is going to share his story one of these times, maybe with the new upcoming section that we're going to do here by Bill and Beverly and friends. John, Don has seen some remarkable things in heaven, some he can't tell us, some he wants to tell us and wants to share because what he saw was beautiful. He shared it with me and some of the others in this room. But we're all going to be taken up there and see that. Wow. Ooh. He still adheres to the common early principle that we. this is... Uh, John saying again that we live by faith, not by sight. Second Corinthians five seven. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. First Corinthians thirteen twelve. And finally, in First John three two, it says, "Dear friends, know we are children. Now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known." It's no accident that the breaking of the seventh seal and final seal will introduce a half an hour of science silence before the vision is resumes not done yet salvation is a free, free gift of God's grace according to Heinz and it's secured for all believers from every age by the sacrificial and substitutionary death of Christ on the cross it was there that he bore our sins and endured the wrath of God against us in those awful moments ascended between heaven and earth the cup of divine judgment fell upon him, Jesus Christ. He who know no sin was made sin for us, that we might receive the righteousness of God as a free gift. Second Corinthians five seventeen to twenty one says, Therefore if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. 
The old is gone, the new has come. And all this is from God who, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. But God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In his death on the cross, he triumphed over sin, death, and hell. No wonder he shouted, it is finished. Dr. Denham. That's a few more words before I finish. In Revelation 7, 17, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them under living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. He's going to feed them. He's going to give them living waters. He's going to give them freedom from heartache and sorrow. What a picture of peace, joy, and quietness. Contrast this with the chapter which follows when the opening of the seals is resumed and we study the judgments of the seven trumpets when the seventh seal is opened. They're pretty awful. If you thought last or two weeks ago was intense, it gets more intense. Here we have a resumption of the awful judgments of the tribulation, but far, far removed from them are his redeemed saints, the church that's been raptured, the martyred saints that have come up, who because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are in a place of eternal bliss and peace. We believe that the fulfillment of the prophecies which we're studying is near. Soon the Lord will come to call out his own and those of you who have heard the message and have been given the invitation but rejected it will have to face the awful day of God with all its terrible judgment. But the day of mercy is still here. The door of grace is still open. Don't miss it. The Lord still invites us. Come unto me and warns you Flee from the wrath of co- to come. Trust in him now. Trust in him now. If you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, there's no better time than right now. There's no better time than this exact moment. It's very simple. All you have to do is confess him as your Savior and believe. Ask Jesus into your heart. Say, Lord Jesus... I ask you to come into my heart. I believe that you were crucified, died, and rose from the dead. I am saved. That's all you have to do. That's all salvation is. You don't have to pay money. You can't buy your way in. You just have to accept him as your Savior and believe that he rose from the dead and took all of his sins, all of your sins upon him, and you shall be saved. Amen to that. So with the coming of the seventh seal, the trumpet judgments are about to start. The wrath is going to be poured out because God is now going to pour out his judgment on the earth to those that refuse to accept him. People will still come to Christ during this time. Some out of fear. Some because they heard the truth. They heard it from their parents or friends such as you here or you at home. They can still come to Christ. They still have a chance not to die. The second cycle of judgments will complete the first half of Daniel's 70th week and set the stage for the introduction of the Antichrist and the great great tribulation to come. Make no mistake, it's coming. Even those that don't believe know something is afoot, something is happening. If we look at the state of the world, it's not very good. And we can all attest to that. Even if you only listen to the news once a week, it's not good. In the climate, in the weather, in the skies, we have a major meteor coming through closer than the moon is next week. We'll be able to see it, unless it's cloudy or something. It's out there. It's not going to hit us. It's not the right time. The time now is for you to accept Christ. The time now is also to hear from Georgianne. She's going to tell you what's going on in the world that relates to all this. So if you're ready, hold your breath. Here we go. What are we building here? <laughs> well, I don't know. My, our, our picture, at the Middle East, <laughs> our Middle East picture is missing, and so is my revelation chart. <laughs> I was wondering what we were building here. 
I was studying this week, I did a message on God's goodness. And it made me think why I was listening to Tom talk tonight. The summation of everything that God is, his love, his power, his forgiveness, his mercy, his grace, is it, it's his goodness. Everything that he is is a summation of God's goodness. And we hear all of this stuff. It sounds so negative, but God is so good. And it made me think about that. I was doing a lot of study on that this week. And I, wow. Wow. We've got a lot going on in the world, don't we? Amazing things are happening. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the Israeli soldier, the one that they were able to uh, have an exchange. 1,027 prisoners in exchange for one man. Netanyahu, who is Prime Minister of Israel, in the past has always said he would never negotiate for something like that, that they would never be able to hold him hostage for negotiations. And I had expressed that to you, that this is something they've never believed in, to do something so extreme. But the concern out there now is that possibly this swap may be a prelude to an attack on Iran. Had they attacked Iran before they had gotten this young man back, he never would have been come back. And the talk out there is several Israeli military commentators have been talking and saying that uh, Netanyahu cleared the deck, that was the quote, before a possible attack on Iran. Something to, t to think about, though, isn't it? How I had expressed to you Prime Minister Netanyahu had always said he was not going to negotiate anything. And there was a lot of pressure on him to get this young man back, and we're grateful that he did. But that, when I was hearing that this week and reading about it, it really made me stop to think, because I was telling you, this isn't the direction he's ever gone before. There are more signs that Israel's getting prepared to launch an attack on Iran. They may be looking at how to undertake a multi-front strategy. It would be Hezbollah in Lebanon. Last week I told you that it is going to be eminent that there is going to be a war with Israel and Lebanon, that it's just a matter of time. And they're looking at a multi-front thing now. Hamas in the Gaza Strip, that they're looking at possibly doing that and Syria. Now when you think about this, if they attack Iran, all of these countries that I just mentioned to you, the Gaza Strip, Lebanon, and Syria, they all have their money coming from Iran. All of their military, everything that they need comes from that area. They're financially backing them. So if Israel attacked Iran, these countries would automatically attack Israel. I told you last week that Lebanon has 50,000 missiles pointed at Israel right now, of which 6,000 will go into Tel Aviv. Gaza Strip is the same way. Hamas is owned by Iran. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it, to think that they would do something like this? They couldn't just do one without doing the others? Now, Syria would be very happy if there was an attack from uh, Israel into Iran because it would take all the news and the eyes of the world off of what's happening in Syria, what they're doing to their people, the way they're, they're killing them and all the uprising and everything that's going on over there. So they would be happy to be off the front page of the paper and, and every place else, the internet, to have this other thing happen. But as I was preparing for this, this so about this multi-front thing made so much sense because I've been telling you week by week how these other countries are out there to get Israel as well. And they would definitely attack them if they went only after Iran. S and Netanyahu this week has been talking with his cabinet about a preemptive strike. I think, I'm not sure, but I think we even heard that on news, did we not, on Fox or somewhere? I wasn't sure if we did or not. Um, the Israeli Air Force this week has been doing maneuvers in an island, and I did not write the island names down. I didn't, I didn't know it to hear it. 
It's the same distance away as Iran is from Israel. And they're doing all of these Air Force maneuvers and flights in a totally different area, but it's the same amount of mileage away. But that was very interesting. We know that the UN sanctions and resolutions are not working over with Iran. So right now, there are embassies that are coming together to talk from the US, from France, the United Kingdom, and Israel, having to do with the situation in Iran. Weather conditions, I've been telling you that the time is getting so short for them to be able to attack that we started talking about this probably the end of August, that the window is very, very small that Israel has. And I was reading a report about there is a snow cloud that goes over Iran for certain times of the season, and there is no way they could attack during that. And that weather is to hit in the next three weeks. So if there is going to be attack from Israel to Iran, it's going to have to happen very, very soon because the weather will, they'll have to wait till next year if they miss this window. But that was very interesting too. They're running against the clock for a military attack and we'll have to wait till next year, I just told you that. Since 1979, Iran has been at war with the US. When they took prisoner, 243 Americans and kept them. That was an act of war against us. The United States has been in Libya. It's been up against Yemen, Iraq, and Afghanistan. We have not gone to Iran, and they are at war with us. Those other countries, we've done something about things, but yet we have done nothing about Iran. So I want to tell you about the Jerusalem Dateline, Iran's growing threats. This was very somber for me this week. I never usually go over any of this information with Tom prior to the night we're here. He hears it, and I want him to hopefully know something he doesn't already know. So last night I sat down and I said, I have some things that I want to run by you that are just bothering me about the information that I've had this week, more so than usual. You know, I'll say, man, I've got interesting stuff for you tonight. But this, I don't know if it's my spirit that is sensing all of this is so in agreement with what I'm telling you or what, but it's different than any other time I put information together for you. This has to do with Iran's growing threat. Hezbollah is under control by Iran, which I've already told you. I told you about the missiles. Iran will bring the war to the U.S. We just heard about, uh, what was it, not even a month ago, about the two attacks against the embassies where they were going to kill a Saudi Arabian and Israeli. And then they were going to go down into South America after that. They will bring the attack here to the United States. They have sleeper cells all over this country already just waiting for the word. Man, I am really sounding like doom. I am so sorry. <laughs> I didn't sound like doom. No, you didn't, but I just, the information that I have really bothered me this week. We must have a military plan on the table, and President Obama does not. We have no foreign policy against Iran established. Doesn't that seem insane to you with where we've been, with the time? Pardon? Political and economic weakness is perceived by Iran for the United States. They see us as very, very weak. They definitely do not fear us. They believe that the 12th Ayman, who is the Mahdi, is going to come soon. But in order for that to happen, and Tom has talked about this so many times, America and Israel has to be destroyed before the 12th diamond can come back. And uh, oh, I keep wanting to say Netanyahu, but it's not him. Armadinejad has told us that he's the forerunner of him and that he will bring him back. He believes that, that he's going to come back because of his power. There's a book out there called uh, The Coming is Near. 
end of days, and it has to do with the, with the Middle East. And I think it was written more for the, uh, for the Muslims than it was for us. There was something that was quoted. The Ayatollah that we have now, that ex not we, but that exists in Iran now, he's believed to be the deputy on this earth of the Mahdi. I heard this statement that when he was born, he spoke something that was so, I mean, they couldn't believe it, knowing that there was something different about this man, that it was a spiritual thing, it wasn't a human thing. And now this Ayatollah and uh, uh, Ahmadinejad, they have approved of a training film that has taken place over, supposedly with the Muslim nations. And in it, it says that they will slaughter all unbelievers in this training thing. Well, a copy of it got out somehow to the West. And there's quite an embarrassment with these two people because their names are on it approving it. They didn't want the world to know that. Things we've already known that, you know, it's, it is not a religion of kindness and love, but of death. Iranian Christians are coming to the Lord in multiple numbers daily. The Lord is appearing to them over there. But they're being persecuted terribly. They're put in solitary confinement. In 2009, we've talked about this pastor, Yosef, that is over there, and he's supposed to be sentenced you know, to death because of his faith in being a Christian. And then they changed all of that because of all the the uproar in the world against that, saying that uh, now it's against rape and all these other things that he's done. But even if he was acquitted and released, his life would be in serious complications, consequences, because he would either be tortured or disappear. That if they let him go, the people will end up torturing him or his, his life will just disappear. So there won't be any safety for him even. They're watching him. You know, the whole world is watching him. So if the, there is a chance that he is acquitted, they'll have to, you know, get him out of that country and in a hurry, his family. One of the things the government Iran is doing is going after house churches. There are so many underground churches, and they're after their leaders, whoever the pastors or whoever are, that they're really watching them and taking them into prison and torturing them. Man, aren't I full of good news? I am so sorry. This seems so serious to me this week, more than ever. One of the questions came up, does Iran already have a nuclear bomb? There is these initials. It's IMPACT, E-M-P-A-C-T, America. It's, it's a group. It says they already have nuclear warheads to hit America and Europe. Now, we know that if an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse bomb, attacked us, it would cripple our infrastructure here. We already know that. That's all it would take to have a submarine let it go off the coast somewhere, and it would just immobilize us. We'd be back to the 1900s. So that's all they would need to have to do you know, when they're ready to do something. Are any of you familiar with Joel Rosenberg? I told you he has such an impact. The knowledge this man has about the, about the Middle East is amazing. When I see him interviewed, I can't get enough of watching and listening to what he has to say. Now, I think it was two weeks ago, I told you he had a new book released that was called uh, Tehran Initiative. There was this whole story, and it put together all these pieces and it has to do with what I've just told you and what we've been talking about in the world. He's being called, Joel Rosenberg, a modern-day Nostradamus. His fictional writing, all of his books, he's written 12 books, and they're all classified as fictional, having to do with the Middle East and America. He's highlighted major worldwide events months before they even occur. Let me tell you about some of the things that have transpired because of his writings. In January of 2001, his first book was called The Last Jihad. It was in a fictional account of a U.S. war with Iraq. That was a couple years before we went to Iraq. This was even before 9-11 happened. He described in this book 
the hijacking of an airliner in an attack on America. But nine months, this book was published and out on the market nine months before 9-11. Now, how long before did it take him to write the book and to get it published? You know, it could have been a couple of years in the process before that date where he gave that information out. His second novel is called The Last Days. It starts with the death of Yasser Arafat. This book was published 13 months before the leader perished. The seventh fictional, oh, seventh. I thought he did 12 books. Excuse me. He's done seven. The seventh one is the one that just came out two weeks ago, the Turan Initiative. In this book, he says, the world is on the brink of disaster and the clock is ticking. Is that not true? Fictional, right? Iran has conducted its first atomic weapon test. Millions of Muslims around the world are convinced their Messiah, who is the 12th diamond, has just arrived on Earth. Israeli leaders fear Tehran will soon launch a nuclear attack that could bring about a second holocaust in the annihilation of Israel. These were things I just told you on previous pages that are news things. This is a fictional book telling us this stuff. The White House fears Israel will strike a first launching a preemptive attack against Iran's nuclear facilities. This could cause the Middle East, this book says that, to go up in flames. Oil prices will skyrocket, global economies will collapse. The president of the U.S. orders the CIA operatives to track down and sabotage Iran's nuclear warheads before Iran and Israel can launch a devastating first strike. This is all fictional stuff, supposedly, in this book. Now, I could not understand when I read this part. I've never understood why there wasn't a covert operation done before any of this had to happen, although we did with that how do you pronounce it, that Stutnex, is that it? Stutnex virus that went on in, over in Iran. I was talking about it last week that there's a second one coming out now. That was an attack that went against them to slow things down. But I never understood why we hadn't done something prior to that. You know, I used to tell Tom that I just don't understand our country with the abilities they have. This is still in the book. The biggest danger we face is that Washington will miscalculate with regards to Iran. Washington will wait too long to neutralize the Iranian threat. Obama's convinced that we can negotiate and engage radical mullahs. They're the ones that run Iran. It's false. We already know that. It's, it doesn't work trying to negotiate with them. And in this book, he says, we didn't understand that the Japanese threat. We didn't understand it until we got hit at Pearl Harbor. We misunderstood Hitler and the Nazis until we had World War II. We underestimated Osama bin Laden, and we had 9-11. Iran's government is driven by the second coming of the 12th Ayman. And in order for that to happen, America and Israel have to be destroyed. Now, these were all facts, all information that came out of his book, this new book, The Tehran Initiative. And I gave you a lot of information on it. I don't know if it was last week or two, two weeks ago when it came out. Do you find this amazing? I mean, I had a really tough time. I sat down and talked to Tom about all this yesterday, wondering if I should, you know, present it or not. Because, but it all flowed together. I gave you three articles of information about present day facts and then I tell you about this fictional stuff that is exactly the same only more advanced almost than some of you know before the incidents actually happened Greece scraps the debt referendum can you believe what we have seen in the last couple of days the EU approved a bailout plan with strong debt control measures they thought it was a go. Everything was ready to go. And the prime minister of Greece, rather than accept the plan, he's going to put it to the people of Greece for a national vote. 
this isn't going to happen this year, this vote. It, can't, it won't happen until next year. The referendum won't occur before next year. Oh, he did. A no vote? He survived the vote of no confidence from his parliament in Greece. So he's still the leader. The, the loan is probably going to go through in the next few weeks. It's in the next year. Wow. All this in Tom just said that the Prime Minister backed off from that. It just seems so foolish and unbelievable that that would happen because they would probably have to go back to the, drac the drachma for mm -hmm. instead of the euro for their revenue and their, their money because they were going to lose face with everything, not to mention everything that they would lose in their country you know, with no backing and finances. When I was putting that together, I was really like, what are you thinking? <laughs> Our president is at the G20. Boy, I can tell on the look of everyone's face, I have just made all of your days, made you depressed. <laughs> I'm sorry. The G20, I think it ended today. It was in Cannes, France, a wonderful, fabulous place to have meetings when the world was in the situation that it is, especially Greece, you know, and they're out there in the best of the best on the seashore. And they were talking about the Greece situation and the massive overspending of the nations in Europe, and I think probably America too. And UNESCO, a group of the UN that voted to add Palestine to the UN. Our president said he's taken $60,000 away from them a year for doing this, that he's going to deny those funds. Million, what did I say? 60 oh, 60 million. I'm sorry. That's what I thought I said. $60 million that they will lose. The Ara I'm so sorry. The Israeli government okays new housing after UNESCO vote. They are going to build 2,000 units housing in Jerusalem. After that vote, they said they're going to put it in now. That was just yesterday that that was okay. I'm going to leave the Middle East now with all of the issues, and I'm sorry, I did not. That's why I was telling you about the goodness of God before. God is so good. This sounds so awful. This is man, not God. The feds predict a weaker growth for economy than Bernanke says. It's a lot less than they thought it would be. 1.7 for 2000 growth for 2011, 2.7% for 2012. They see unemployment at the end of 2012 being at 8.6% still. I told you I was leaving the Middle East for better stuff, but this is right at home bad stuff. <laughs> Bank of America, this is good news. They dropped the fee that was going to be monthly to use your debit card. All the other banks have seemed to back down. 306 people signed a, peti a petition against this, and it made B of A back down. A lot of people pulled out from the bank also. Credit unions are loving it. They're up 306% on people coming in and opening accounts. So that was good news. I'm trying to find something to make you smile. Everyone, <laughs> gosh, we need to give everyone candy now. <laughs> How about those Wall Street protesters? You know that peace movement that's been going around the country? Did you see Oakland, California this week? Oh, my goodness. The violence on Wednesday night that took place, they clashed with riot police, set bonfires, sprayed graffiti, burned things down, shattered windows, blocked roads. They shut down the Port of Oakland, which is the fifth largest in this country. They shut it down. People were not able to make their shifts because they couldn't get through. City lost tax revenue. One protester actually said this is what they stand for. Stop the flow of capital. Does this make any sense, any of this? Wow. How about the in, in God we trust? The vote got passed. It's still going to be on our dollar, in our courthouses, in our schools. In God we trust. Can you believe that that was ever a question in America? That we have come to that? That people were doubting that it was necessary? Wow. Quote from President Obama regarding this. I trust in God, but God wants to see us help ourselves by putting people back to work. Just pass the job bill. 
seven million people on the planet. This week, the seventh million person. Billion. billion I'm sorry. <laughs> Downscaling everything. <laughs> the seventh billion person was born, I think, in the Philippines. And then so many others in other countries have been the same week. But we have seven billion people, just like it was in the day of Noah. Seven billion people. <sighs> Policy forces nurses to perform abortions at the University of Medicine in New Jersey. Twelve nurses are suing the hospital. They refuse to participate in abortions. They'll face termination if they don't change their mind. This is good news. Conjoined twins separated during a 10-hour surgery at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Sanford. There were two girls, of course. There were Filipino girls. They were connected at the chest and the abdomen. I don't know how old they were, though. But Oh, they were two years old. 20 doctors did surgery for 10 hours. Prognosis, happy and healthy children. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that unbelievable? Now, there's an act of God, right? Through the hand of man. Just thought that was impressive. Billy Graham. Now his sermons are going to be available on the web. There are a thousand sermons that you can pull up on the web. You have to have a computer first, Bill. You can get them by date, by location, or subject matter. You can look them up any of those ways. I thought that's pretty cool. Talk about him living in infamy, huh? California University introduces the first U.S. multi-faith school of theology. This is a graduate university where they bring Christian, Jews, and Muslims together in a classroom at the same time to educate leaders for churches, synagogues, and mosques. Wow. You'll love this, Tom. Christian Church invites high priestess of ISIS to speak at a conference. Tom's talked about ISIS before and all the different things that have happened in the, you know, in the Middle East with religion and things. There's the fifth annual Faith and Feminism Conference, November 11th and 13th. Ladies, are you willing to go? It's in San Francisco. It's hosted by Ebenezer Lutheran Church. Can you believe it? Guided meditations by a high priestess of the pagan fertility god, Isis. Just when you think you've seen it all. Now, I do have good news. My final two stories. Tim Tebow. Anyone know who he is? Tim Tebow is a young man who professes Christianity with everything that is in him. He uh, was a Heisman Trophy winner with the University of Florida. He brought them two collegiate championships. He's in his second year of the NFL with the Denver Broncos. He's very outspoken with his Christianity and his beliefs. Um, he's been known for kneeling down on one knee and put his hand across his knee and praying before, during, and after games, giving the Lord praise and glory. He wears a black strip under his eye. It looks almost like a Band-Aid that's black, and it says John 3.16. He wore that in college, and he's wearing it in the pros. Now, this young man loves the Lord. We need people like him for our children. We have all these musicians and all these people from Hollywood and especially all our athletes. You know, our children are looking for role models and what do they have? There is a man like this worthy of attention. But at the same time, just the way people are anti-Christian, they are really attacking him on Facebook and the web and every place they can, Twitter, they are saying he's nothing but a phony, holier than thou, and all this and that. I mean, they're really, that he's not for real. But he is for real, a man of God, a man of integrity, and young, you know, probably, what, 24, 25 at the most. Praise God. May give him strength to endure. Last but not least, Undercover Boss. Has anyone ever seen that on TV? It is a program, last an hour. They take top executives from big companies, 
and the man comes down to work in the most menial of positions within that company and no one knows who he is he finds out how his employees are doing things that might help the company what they like what they don't like in the company it's really I've only seen it once but it was so awesome my daughter tells me almost every week she loves this program there is a gentleman from Orange County California he is this his name is David Kim he's a Korean uh, immigrant He's been someone who helps struggling companies turn around. He's the CEO at Baja Fresh. We have one here. There are 300 store, no, there are 400 stores in 30 states. It's a $300 million operation. And he did this program. He went down and he were, I did not see this, but they were talking about the interview. He stopped and prayed a quiet prayer with a young man that was hurting in his business. Not, and this man had no idea who he was dealing with. He didn't know he was the CEO. And just prayed. And it had such a big response from people's return saying, yes, I needed to hear that. This man says that his code is that your children should do better than you do in what they know, what they've earned, what they give to make a difference in the world. And he's not a very old man. I mean, I maybe 40s. They interviewed his wife, who was Korean also, and she talked about how the missionaries went to Korea when she was a little girl, and she broke down while she was talking about it. She said, that's how I knew about Jesus Christ, and that her husband and she are so in love with God, and every night they sit with the word of God, teaching their children and things. But is that an awesome thing to hear about a man in a company that without thinking, it was second nature to him. It wasn't planned. He had an employee when, you know, who was, and he's undercover, but the employee was hurting. So his thought was just pray for him to get him through it because that was his life. Jesus was his life or is his life. So I apologize for the bad news, but think about Tim Tebow. And think about Kim, I've forgotten his last name, uh, David Kim, the CEO of Baja Fresh. Good news there. I feel like I'm going to be stoned. I'm going to move the gallows so we don't have to use it. Tom's moving the gallows so that he can come in. <laughs> well, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. I want you to hold up the people at, at uh, Light the Fire New Zealand. <laughs> High down in New Zealand where it's light, it's yesterday, tomorrow, whatever. And it's sunny. <laughs> it's 18 hours different and they're having summer. Um, I'd like you to just hold up our government in prayer. They need a lot of help, we know that, but prayer changes a lot of things. And I, wanna, I hope you at home who've heard this message, if you've accepted Christ tonight, please drop us a note, let us know. We'll send you a gift, we'll send you a Bible. Also, if you'd like to partner with this ministry, we'd love to have you as a partner. And we'd ap we appreciate your prayers. So, Father, I just thank you. give you glory and honor and praise for all that you said and did tonight. We know of your grace and your mercy. We know that your arms are still open wide for us to run into and be loved by you and to be given shelter. Lord, we just thank you for your blessing and your healing power that's going out to those at home and those here tonight, Lord, that you would touch each and every one of them, Lord. And, Father, I lift up, and again, traveling mercies with, with Light the Fire in New Zealand, Pastor Dave and the people that are with him, Lord, and the people that he's ministering to. Bless them as well. And so, Lord, we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We do have a healing rooms on Monday nights. If you have prayers, please send them in. We will lift them up. These go around the world. We don't mention names. So next week, we're going to start Chapter 8, and we're going to start hearing about trumpets. So if you don't think this was good news, that could get worse. You going to bring your trumpet? No, I'll leave my trumpet at home. So God bless you all. Thank you for coming, and good night. And we invite you to